Hey, hello. My name is Braxton Willoughby. I'm a second year occupational therapy student, and I'm really proud to welcome you to this event, which is hosted by COTAD Chapter at SUNY Downstate Medical Center. Um, I think that diversity in health professions is an incredibly important topic for a variety of reasons. Studies have shown that increasing ethnic diversity among healthcare professionals leads to greater patient satisfaction, and that when patients see clinicians who look a little bit more like them and who have similar backgrounds as them, they're more likely to engage in conversation and as a result, receive better health care for themselves and for their families. Uh, before starting this event, I would just love to thank our panelists so much. Maybe a quick round of applause. I'd like to thank Interim Chair Dr. Desport. Um, I'd like to thank Dean Lewis. I'd like to thank all the alumni who are in the audience. Uh, we have the past president of COTAD from last year, Kiana. Maybe one more round of applause. And so, in a time when there's more diversity in America than ever before, I think that the value of cultural humility and empathy is ever-present. And it's events like this that open up a dialogue for new experiences, interconnectedness, and personal growth. That brings us to the question, what is COTAD? COTAD is the Coalition of Occupational Therapy Advocates for Diversity, and the COTAD chapter program was started in 2017 by Dr. Anverizare with a mission to promote diversity and inclusion within the occupational therapy workforce and to strive to empower practitioners, educators, and students to enhance cultural humility, promote diversity, and inclusion. Each chapter is designed to create opportunities and resources to foster open conversations and increase awareness and appreciation of different lived experiences. In 2018, Downstate was the first academic institution to have a COTAD chopster in New York State. But even more, it's great, <laughs> and even more, you're also the first one to have a chopster on all of the East Coast. This chapter was developed by SUNY Downstate Occupational Therapy students and faculty advisor, Professor Vikram Pickpatton, in order to foster an environment that promotes cultural humility and spreads awareness of topics related to inclusion and cultural sensitivity. In last year, 2018, we ran our first interdisciplinary panel discussion on the topic of diversity. <laughs> we threw an open mic fundraiser and created a holiday toy drive for children living in homeless shelters. This year, we created a fall festival themed around cultural activities. We have a Valentine's Day mixer planned for February, and in the spring, we'll be visiting elementary schools in Brooklyn to talk about occupational therapy and promote the importance of diversity and equality to a younger generation. At this time, I would like to formally introduce you to our moderator for this evening, Dr. Jasmine Thomas. <laughs> Dr. Thomas is an assistant professor and the director of clinical education in the occupational therapy program at SUNY Downstate. Her clinical expertise is in the area of pediatrics, evaluating and treating children from the age of zero to 21 years of age with various conditions. She is passionate about promoting and improving equal access to health care for all people. And she does a really great job inspiring students to develop empathy for all people and to advocate for the needs of the disenfranchised. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Thomas. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Braxton, for that wonderful introduction about COTAD. Um, it is really my pleasure to moderate the second annual event. Um, as Braxton talked about, and he spoke so eloquently, how valuable these events are. Because it's when we take opportunities such as this to um, listen to um, a group of experts about 
complex um, topics and they help us to learn, grow, and even challenge our thinking. When we take the time to do this, we can make improvements in our personal way that we deliver healthcare, um, systematic changes, and institutional changes. So that is the challenge that uh, I bring to each one of you guys. And so I really thank you for coming and participating in such a tremendously important event. Um, as I said, we have a group of experts up here, and you have the opportunity to hear from them, their thoughts, their experiences, their observations, um, and their insights into the, what is happening in the current healthcare system, um, from the beginning of being trained as a student to practicing for many, many years. Um, so I want each panelist to take an opportunity to introduce themselves. Please state your name, um, where you work, your area of expertise or clinical background. So we'll start with Felix. Good evening, everyone. My name is Felix Omagina. I'm the chair and program director of uh, the PA program here at uh, SUNY Downstate. Thank you. Um, I am also a PA in clinical practice. I've been a PA for the last uh, 26 years. And I've been a faculty at Downstate for 22 years. And I've been a program director for the last... Uh, Thank you. <laughs> and I've been the program director for the last uh, six years on the PA program. I guess uh, my claim to fame is uh, having been involved in uh, all aspects of uh, the admissions process to uh, our program. And I have uh, learned you know, quite a bit. I don't claim to be an expert, but uh, mm -hmm. I'll share whatever insight that I've gained over this period. Thanks. Hi. Good evening, everyone. I'm Carla Buten Foster. I'm a physician and the Associate Dean for Diversity Education and Research in the College of Medicine. I'm also a graduate of um, SUNY Downstate, class of 1994. <laughs> um, if we're talking about culture, I am an immigrant, a proud immigrant, born in Haiti and raised in Brooklyn. And um, thank you. And I look forward to contributing to this conversation. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Soila Rojas and I'm an occupational therapist. Um, for those that don't know, my, those who, oh, occupational therapy students that didn't know, I was a community organizer and health worker for almost 10 years before I was an occupational therapist. I mostly work with undocumented immigrants um, and Spanish speakers and older adults in Washington Heights and Sunset Park. Um, I've been an occupational therapist for two years and I work at Kings County Hospital. I'm also a research therapist for the Visiting Nurse Service of New York. And I definitely do not claim to be an expert because I'm basically a toddler therapist, only two years. Um, but I hope I can share my insight, like you said. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Alan Lewis, as many of you know. Oh boy, my background is long. So I've, uh, this is my fifth institution I've worked in. Um, Diversity, cultural diversity is something I have um, been a student of for many years. I'm not really sure there's any such thing as an expert. I tell any time I talk to students, I say there are no experts. An expert is somebody who can answer any question you pose, no matter what that question is on a given topic. And I don't know anybody who has that level of knowledge. But they're advanced learners and less advanced learners on a given topic. So it's relative. So I um, started teaching about culture and diversity in 1998, so about 20 years. Um, and my background, my clinical background is in rehabilitation counseling. And that's about half, half of my career, actually. Uh, I'm old. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but we'll share some insights tonight and uh, we'll see where it takes us. Looking forward to all your questions. Hello, everyone. Hello, Columbia. Uh, my name is Razan Hamid, and uh, I'm a Jordanian-American uh, occupational therapist. I've been an occupational therapist since uh, 2003. My clinical background is clinical psychiatry. Um, right now, I'm working with substance abuse and uh, designing intervention programs for minorities and vulnerable populations. Uh, I've been faculty for a long time, and then I was... Um, Assist, um, assistant Dean and then Vice Dean and then uh, most recently a program director and department chair at um, 
at NYIT um, on Long Island. Right now, I'm with Columbia University, and I teach research and uh, health policy. Not anymore, but right now, we just research. Um, as everyone said, uh, as Dr. Um, Lewis said, I'm sorry. We just, we just, we just met. met. I mean, he's amazing, but we just <coughs> met. Um, there is no expert in diversity. Anyone with experience in diversity or any encounter when diversity is, um, has been well served or not served has an insight and can say something about diversity. And I was really excited to, to join this panel um, knowing that it's organized by students. This is really, it is impressive. Here at Columbia, we need a chapter. Okay? Go <laughs> down, jump. So, glad to be here. Uh, welcome to each one of our panelists. Um, I am looking forward to a lively discussion. Um, feel free to interact with one another. This is what we're here for. Um, so we'll have around an hour um, for the uh, panelists to discuss, and then afterwards we'll open up it up to the audience for any questions or comments. So as I said, today's topic will range from you know formal training, being in an educational program, all the way to practice. Um, and so there's a lot to cover, um, a lot of topics. And you know, as you said, COTAD was organized by students, and all these questions were actually um, created by the students because these are important topics to them as becoming future practitioners, and they will carry forward our profession. So that's why these questions are so valuable. Um, because they were formulated by students and uh, important to them. So let's get started. Let's dive right in. Um, so we're talking about education. Um, Braxton mentioned the diversity of America. The landscape of America has changed drastically. Um, the mi uh, minority populations have grown, and we could see that, um, that there are changes within our country. But do you feel like that that actually translates to healthcare programs? Um, do you feel like there's enough representation of diversity within educational healthcare programs? And should institutions be intentional in creating diversity? Anyone can jump in. Okay. Mm. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, <laughs> I feel you never ask, like, do we have enough Starbucks all over the place? We know that. We know that we have enough Starbucks. And I feel like if we if we do have enough diversity in our healthcare uh, uh, programs, we wouldn't be asking this question we wouldn't be having this panel. So I, I still feel that we, um, we still have some work to do with, with diversity. And I feel some, one of the, the problems that um, add to the reason why we don't have enough diversity in our programs is sometimes we tend to minimize the definition of diversity to ethnic diversity or racial diversity. And we end up, you know, coming from a, a program director background, I was in that, that seat where you have to report numbers of people based on their racial or ethnic diversity. And it boils down to a headcount. How many people do you have in your program? And you would report that to your chair or to your dean. And once you have a decent headcount, you feel like, okay, we're, we're happy with, with our diversity. Mm -hmm. And you'll brag about it. It's like, oh, we're a diverse program. And I feel if we really want to see diversity at its peak, we need to redefine diversity. And uh, we need to make sure that we understand diversity and the purpose of it. Do we just want a head count? Do we, be, do we want to be um, politically correct? Or do we really want a rich ground where our students can share experiences and perspectives and, and minds and different cultures? And I feel once we understand that definition and we have a very clear picture of like how diverse we want our programs to be, then we will have a satisfying level of diversity. So the question is, I don't think we have enough diversity in our programs, uh, guilty as charged. I was a program director myself, and I can see that we can always, there's always room for improvement when it comes to diversity. And we need to open up the definition of that word. I would like to add that, uh, yes, we should be intentional. And I'll tell you a couple of stories. I like stories. So uh, in all my institutional experiences, when I was at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia, uh, I was in a school much like this, but a larger school. And just as an example, I think we had about 100 faculty. I was the only faculty of color in that whole school. Um, 
And that was uh, not that long ago. It was uh, 2001 through 2013 or something like 2012. And then when I went to Pitt, my next institution, University of Pittsburgh, same situation, another school about this size, or like this, but much larger. We had probably 150 faculty. Again, the only faculty of color in the, old, in the whole school. So uh, when I first started teaching multicultural counseling in my rehabilitation counseling background at Virginia College University, probably 1998, so about 20 years ago, it was interesting because one of the students said the first night of class, he said, Dr. Lewis, I'm so happy to see that I have a black male professor, first time in my whole educational career I've had a black male professor. And I said, okay, so, and so he, here's the thing about diversity. So I said, okay, first of all, how do you know I'm a black male professor? He had this real puzzled look on his face. How do I know? I said, how do you know? He says, I'm looking at you. You look like you're a black male. I said, okay, all right, I'll give you that. So I am a black male. I said, but now that you've, made, you've come to that conclusion, what is it that you really can say that you know about me for sure? Again, he had that puzzle look. And I said, okay, so yes, I'm just, and he was a black male. I said, we're similar in that way, but what is similar about us now that you've come to that conclusion? Can you say anything about me now that you put me in that box that you can say with certainty? I said, do I dance well? Do I shoot basketball well? You know, all these traditional stereotypes. And I said, I don't do it through any of those things well. And he says, what do you mean? I said, here's your first teachable moment. Just because you identify somebody as being in a particular group doesn't mean you know anything about them because there's so much within group diversity. So therein is the first wrinkle and complication of cultural diversity. And I'll say that luckily here in this particular institution, we have a lot more in terms of diverse faculty and students. Uh, but then we still haven't dealt with that challenge of just because you put somebody in the box of being X, Y, or Z doesn't mean that you know anything about them. And what that comes down to is the reality that we all have to look at each other as individuals. You know, all those diversity labels are very important. Race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, spiritual orientation, all those things are very important. And as my colleague said, we need to be broader than race. Why are we so obsessed with race in this country? Why do we always think of race and ethnicity? Anybody? Two reasons. Two very basic reasons. The history of this country, right? What am I referring to there? Slavery experience, where who was oppressed and the oppressor was determined by race. And what's the other reason? If I look at Sola, can I tell what her sexual orientation is? Can I tell what her spiritual orientation is? Can I tell her socioeconomic status? Can I tell if she's a Republican or a Democrat? But can I, I think I can tell what her race and ethnicity is. I could be wrong, and chances are I would be wrong. But everybody thinks you can make a judgment based on visibility when it comes to race and ethnicity. That's why we are so obsessed with that particular dimension, that and the slavery experience in this country. As my, again, as my colleague said, we've got to get much broader and we've got to think about within group differences as well. So I'll stop, because I can talk forever. <laughs> I'd like to answer next. Um, how many of you are Hispanic women, identify as Hispanic women? Okay. Are you guys in master's level programs? When you graduate, you're going to be part of the 3%. Okay. So I want you to think about the barriers to entry that it took to get you there. Now think about the barriers to entry it will take for you to eventually become a person in a position of leadership. So because of the barriers that we have, not just me, but all members of minority groups, the barriers to entry to these areas of leadership and then education are so much higher. So I, I sometimes ask myself, like, what kind of pool of applicants are universities getting? Do they look like the students they're supposed to represent? Can they even? Are they at that stage? Um, I ask myself that question all the time because it took me five and a half years to even step foot into Downstate as a student. I was working full time. I was doing extra courses. I had a lot of immigrant students also support their families, so things took longer. Barriers were greater. And when you think about what it took to become a student, to sit here, to be at Downstate, think about how you got your volunteer experiences. Who did you know? Could you take time off? Could you justify that to your boss when you have to make, pay your bills to help your mom because she can't work or whatever it is? So there are a greater amount of barriers to entry to even step foot and be a student into this institution, let alone a professor. So there's not enough representation, obviously, 
But the question is, when are we going to know? So have you guys ever heard that quote that Ruth Bader Ginsburg said when they asked her, when will you know that the Supreme Court has enough women? What is it? Yep. When there are nine, that's the answer. So until we have normalized the representation of our leadership, where having people of color, of different ethnicities, of different sexual orientations, gender identifications, is completely normal to us, then we, kinda, we can say we're approaching equity. Not there yet, but we're getting there. So think about the path it's gonna take each of us as students of colors, as minorities, as having all these barriers. What is it gonna take for me to get to that leadership position if it took so much for me to be here a student? You know, that word that you use, Zoila, normalize. And we talk about um, teaching, like, so if we bring diversity and we want to normalize diversity, that it becomes like something we don't even think about. But I think institutions, they have the responsibility to be able to teach um, for us to work with one another and also for, to work with um, our clients about cultural sensitivity. Um, so how would you say a program would do that formally and informally to increase a student body's um, awareness and openness about, you know, we talked about culture and individuals and normalizing diversity, but that has to happen intentionally. And we had, as programs, we need to be able to create that for our students and teach our students to be able to do that. So how would you say that can be made possible? So um, in terms of, and then thank you for, for hosting this, this conversation. I think these are important topics that we need to discuss. Um, in terms of culture, so, so we have to understand the, this, desire to be culturally competent, mm -hmm. which can actually promote more stereotypes. So as Dr. Lewis said, I'm a black woman, but looking at me, that's all you know. Mm -hmm. And we make assumptions, um, we stereotype, mm -hmm. and we group people who look similar and we attribute certain characteristics. So in talking about cultural sensitivity and cultural competence, um, I mean, you talk about cultural humility, and I know mm -hmm. you're gonna get to that, that is really reflecting on um, who are we and, and what are the different identities that we hold. Um, and this identity may change depending on the group that you're in. And in terms of um, what, what Dr. Lewis said about race, I think um, we do spend a lot of time talking about race because the way that I look to someone is how I'm treated. So the first glance that you see a woman of color, um, depending on the audience, She's a black girl, right? And physician, mother, deacon at her church, um, wife, you know, associate dean, that may not even come to someone's purview. They may not even think that. But when someone looks at me, the first thing they may see is black. And because of that, they treat me a certain way. So I think before we talk about, I mean, we're gonna talk about culture and I think it's important, but we also have to be a reality to be honest that there is a lot of focus on race because that's what people see. And as you know, race is not biological, it's a social construct. And 10 years from now, when we look at the census, there will be different races added to that category. So I think um, this conversation on race is, is very important, but when it comes to culture, we just have to make sure that we're not pigeonholing people and we're not, and, and I agree with Dr. Lewis, that we're not trying to put people in boxes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the way not to do it is, and there are cultural competency curriculum and programs out there that say, this is this person, this is what they do, so therefore you're culturally competent on group X, check, mm -hmm. right? But that's not the approach to attaining cultural sensitivity. It's really in dialogue like this, meeting with people, eating with other people. You know, in the cafeteria, if you walk around the cafeteria, you see people sitting in groups, right? And if we were to break apart these groups and say, no, you sit here. You know, you can't sit with someone you know, mm -hmm. right? You, we learn about each other because if that doesn't happen, then we call people the others. Mm -hmm. And we treat people who do not look like us as others. And when it's treating patients as others, that's what contributes to health disparities. So I think we have to also look at the big picture. When we talk about diversity and cultural competency, 
this has life and death implications on people. And I don't know if I answered your question, but I had the mic and I just thought I'd go for it. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> Well, repeat the question again. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. We had an answer. Yeah. Uh, the 2012 National Healthcare Disparities Report uh, makes a conclusion, which uh, has been mentioned you know, here, that uh, patients are best served by uh, clinicians of all kind yeah. who look like themselves. And um, as far as admissions go, and if you use this uh, college as an example, uh, there are often many drivers that uh, prevent us from uh, making any effort towards uh, recruiting you know, underrepresented minorities. And uh, those drivers include our concern for attrition rate. Uh, those drivers include our concern for board passing outcome. And uh, they include uh, and our concern for finance, you know, how much money um, is going to come in from you know, students. And um, having been uh, here at Downstate for uh, 22 plus years in our college, uh, I've seen that the best way, and by the way, I'm a Downstate grad, class of 1993. And uh, the best way to begin to break uh, down the barriers that exist is by actually having a diverse class of students. I've um, personally had, you know, heard students uh, say that the best thing that happened to them was uh, actually coming to Downstate, meeting those that aren't like them, you know, uh, breaking out of uh, uh, mindsets that were in ingrained, you know, uh, on the, by their families, by their, you know, respective, close, you know, um, um, so uh, communities. So we can, if we don't start with the basics, it's impossible to address the other, you know, um, uh, inadequacies you know, that exist in, uh, in uh, healthcare professions. So my program, and I'm proud of it, uh, we are very intentional in uh, our recruitment. And uh, on one hand, uh, because we look beyond anyone who's uh, screened will realize that the first two years are a total waste. So we look at what happened by the time they finally wake up, uh, sophomore, I mean junior and uh, senior years. If you look at the transcript of a thousand minority students who go out to school, most are not prepared for college. So except for a few really bright students, the freshman year is littered with C minuses. C pluses, maybe the best you know, grade would be a B minus. It goes on to sophomore. And by the time they realize, whoa, I need to you know, really wake up, the grades improve beginning in junior year. And that's why a lot of uh, you know, our programs in healthcare professions are beginning to focus on the last 60 credits. But that isn't you know, the case here in our college. I mean, it has to be intentional. I mean, we can consider all other factors, but if we're not intentional in our admissions process, we are not going to bring students who are dissimilar in the same class. We are not going to begin to, you know, make, break down the barriers. And uh, our biggest ambassadors are the students who actually, whoa, realize, oh, they are not really like that. Oh, we can actually be friends. Oh, we actually have more in common then we are dissimilar. And then carry that back to their respective communities. That's why we begin to break down the changes. Mm -hmm. I'm not an expert at one. If I can, I, I really applaud the fact that the PA program is very intentional about how they look at transcripts um, and building that um, diverse class. We're talking about basics, right? At least get diversity into the classroom. Um, and then, you know, Carla, you talked a little bit about that sitting down together and eating together and, you know, you see that you have more in common. But, you know, we talk about these are social con constructs. This is a systematic um, problem where it's all around us. We were, we all have our personal, like, implicit biases. 
So how do you encourage educational programs? And I, I'm looking at you, Alan, because you are the dean. Um, how do you encourage educational programs to be formal about breaking down these constructs so that when they go out there and they're working in um, with populations that they're not familiar with, even if they have a classmate, right. you know, of the same, you know, um, sexual orientation or ethnicity or same beliefs, like, are we doing enough and what can we do? We're definitely not doing enough. And I, I, you know, I have a couple comments. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we got these two ladies who had comments as well. Mm -hmm. uh, should they go first? Go ahead, Alan, and then okay, you guys can right. jump uh, in. I'm a ladies first kind of guy. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so um, one of the things we're trying to do in this college uh, soon, and it's going to be a research project, which is why we're sort of dragging along with it. Uh, I, I developed a model 10 years ago on how you infuse culture into every course. So one of the things we have to do is, in many curricula, its culture is a course. And that's good because it's there somewhere. But the reality is, is that everything you're doing has a cultural component. If you're dealing with people, it has a cultural component. So we're going to try to pretty soon to launch our new initiative in this particular school where we're going to infuse culture. It's a four-step process that the course instructor has to marshal and oversee. But we're going to be soon infusing culture to every course. It's already in courses, I know, but we want it in every course, even anatomy and physiology. Uh, because even those courses have some cultural components that you must understand. So that's important. The other thing is, you guys are trained, you guys and gals are trained to be clinicians, right? One of the things that, that you don't see much of in the literature, you see a lot of talk about cultural diversity. You gotta be better at this, more sensitive, more cultural uh, humility, cultural efficacy, cultural competency, sensitivity, awareness, all these newer terms. But nobody tells you how you actually start doing that. So again, something I did years ago when I was in my research mode, there's something called the three-dimensional model tool or three-factor tool. If you look it up, um, and it's in the literature, when you, when you first meet a brand new client, customer, consumer of services, you have to get to know who that person is in at least three domains. And my background is in disability. So one of the domains for me is disability, but it doesn't really matter what, you, what you're doing. The three domains are who is, how does the person identify culturally, how are they functioning developmentally, and what is their goal of the service that you're providing? What's the outcome they, they are wanting to achieve? Those are the three domains. And you've got to come up with, as a clinician, a system that allows you to explore those three areas every time you come face to face with a new person who's receiving services from you. Because the more that you can do that, the better off you will be able to provide services that meet that person's expectations. Because you'll know who they are culturally, how they function developmentally, and where they want to go in terms of the destination of their their goals and outcomes for the services. If you don't do that, then you're not going to be a good provider. So I suggest that everybody begin to think about how you can develop and weave into your own clinical approach a way to basically interview people and collect data in those three domains. The three-dimensional model tool is a tool that I developed that allows each clinician to think about what those three things mean conceptually, how they apply to the population you're working with, how they apply to the context you're working in, and to develop a tool that's unique to you and your clinical style that meshes with your clinical approach so that it's a part of who you are so that every time you meet a brand new person in a clinical situation, you have to be willing to invoke this tool because it's going to help you, first of all, build that relationship and it's going to give you data, it's going to flush out data that will allow you to put together a better treatment plan, right? You know who they are culturally, how they identify themselves, not what, not what box I put them in, what that person says about his or her identity, how they're functioning developmentally, and what their goal of treatment is. The other thing we got, so, so try, look up that tool, and, and I can give you information on it if you want to know about it, but if you can begin as clinicians to develop ways, concrete ways, that allow you to explore who people are, it's going to serve you well over the course of your career. Because we see, you see a lot of talk about we've got to do better, but rarely do you see any tools that say, here's exactly something you can use in your clinical practice that allows you to actually do better in terms of dealing with cultural issues. The other thing we have to do, I think, in a much better way is make the, I call it make the business argument about culture. There, there's a good bottom line business reason why we have to do better with culture. In 1999 in this country, 20% of the U.S. population was non-white. And they, they, then the census said by 2050, it'll be half the population will be non-white. But we're ahead of that. So probably by 2030, if not earlier, at least half the U.S. population will be non-white. So if you're a clinician, chances are, as you guys finish your programs and go out, Many of the people you'll be serving would be persons who have 
non-white cultural identities and have all many other cultural identities because each person has many cultural identities. You guys have identities as a downstate student in a particular program. If you're from Brooklyn, you have that identity. If you're a U.S. citizen, you have that identity. If you're a Republican, you have that identity. Whatever. We have many identities, right? But talking about racial identity, the chances are, and ethnic identity, the chances are when you get out into the real world, you folks finish your curriculum here and get out working, most of the folks you're working with are going to have a non-white cultural identity and going forward, but just because of the colorization that's occurring in our U.S. landscape, right? So that means you're going to have to be able to serve those persons well, because if you can't, you're going to be wasting resources. The accountability demand is intersecting with the cultural demand. We all are going to have to work smarter and not harder and be sure that we deploy ourselves in ways that produce positive outcomes. Pretty soon your supervisors will be asking you, uh, Kate, as an occupational therapist, <laughs> we're paying you $120,000 a year to deliver the service. Tell us what the outcomes you're producing, why we should continue paying you that. That means you cannot afford to not be affected with everybody who comes across your doorstep, no matter what their racial ethnic orientation is, right? You've got to be effective. Otherwise, you're wasting resources and you're not contributing to your own effectiveness as a clinician. So the business argument is, is that we're all being asked to do more with less. None of us can afford in an increasingly diverse landscape to not work well with everybody we serve. And with the fact that the population is becoming more colorized, there are more people who will be very different from us that we're serving. That's a bottom line business argument. If you want to be effective and keep your jobs and promote the right outcomes, you have to learn to work successfully with diverse populations. Right? Mm -hmm. And you need tools. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> More later from me. Okay, ladies, you guys are gonna say first. Uh, I just wanted to add something. One of the things that, like, I love these concrete ideas, um, but also one of the things that we have to do as faculty members, and also you as students, we need to desensitize the talk about diversity. We need to reach a point where we feel comfortable talking about diversity. Most of these, we still tiptoe about, around talking about diversity, and most of these conversations are either like heated or they express a disappointment that we don't have enough diverse students, we, we don't do enough. And so like that negative vibe around diversity, we need to desensitize that. We need to feel comfortable talking about like, why don't we have enough um, Hispanic students in the program? What, what can we do better? And also the students themselves, and I like what uh, my colleague here said, um, it takes two to tango. You also have to, to go against all odds and present yourself and work hard to be represented as well. Whether it's by a conversation, whether it's by uh, uh, reaching out to uh, faculty members, program directors, seeing like what, kind, what can I do to, 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 to get a seat um, at the table. So um, desensitizing the conversations, feeling more comfortable, um, talking about diversity, and also some of the uh, very, um, we need to be creative how we teach. Now, it's Thanksgiving now, for example. Um, some of the mandatory assignments should be, as you mentioned, um, go have a Thanksgiving dinner with, with, with a family that is not from the same group that you belong to. Uh, why can't we have assignments that, let's say, by the end, by the end of your program that you have to do a community-based trip or a workshop or a, a <coughs> seminar or you have to attend some kind of event that has to do with culture. Uh, and that has to be mandatory. Uh, we worry, like I'll talk about OT, we worry so much about field work. Any OT students here? Mm -hmm. we, we have that talk mm -hmm. about field work and which level and which facility but we never worry that much the same way about diversity. Why shouldn't we start um, um, uh, designating fieldwork experiences to serve diversity? And we don't always have to follow just the minimum standards of accreditation. We know we're obsessed with, with ACOT standards and, and we, we, we need to meet the accreditation standards, but also uh, how many fieldwork experiences did you have about the LGBT community? How many uh, service learning trips did you take to learn more about other cultures? It could also be, be small assignments like watch a movie, watch a foreign movie that uh, uh, discusses or reflects a culture that is not similar to your culture. So little things we could do, creative thinking, because we have a very creative generation here. You guys are very smart and you're very resourceful and I think we should start uh, using that to our your benefit as well. Um, that's it.
Thank you for mentioning field work, because that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. I was very lucky that I had my level two at a very diverse hospital. Um, so for those of you that don't know what level two is, level two is basically our internship. That's when we're doing direct patient care as occupational therapists. Um, and at the end of this level two, uh, the director, who is very, you know, always receptive towards new feedback from the students, she has to sit down and get, ask us, she asks us, what do you think about your level two? Do you have any feedback for it? Now at this level two, they have a very structured program. They have, they're the one, you guys already know, they're the one that has a lot of assignments for those of you that, that know who I am. Um, and one of the assignments that, I mean, they didn't have this. So I told the director, I'm like, you serve a population that is mostly minority, um, people of different ethnicities, backgrounds, um, and yet one of your assignments doesn't have to do anything with that. So I said to her, you should make an assignment for that for one of your students. And she told me, okay, make it, and I did. <laughs> so um, I, I don't know if they're using it, but um, I know that when I have a level two student, which I will this summer, yes. they will be doing it. Uh, because I think that um, in the process of being an occupational therapist, I mean, every single aspect of being an OT, the type of assessments you pick, are huge, is huge. You guys already know that. There are some things that are assessed that have nothing to do with what the person is, you know, with their life because of their given background or whatever experience. Um, so the type of assessments you put, pick, the way you analyze the results of that assessment given their exposure to that information, if they had past previous exposure to it, uh, the type of treatment you design, whether or not if that treatment will be carried over, your discharge recommendations, can they even happen? Do they have the resources? Do they have the knowledge? Do they have the social supports? Do they care? Do they have the motivation? And all these things are in, our culture is interweaved through all of this. And you know, we can't escape the fact that, I'm sure there's gonna be a question that comes to that, but healthcare was built on top of enslaved people, like hospitals were. So we have to acknowledge the fact that when we're, when we're clinicians, we're coming in with a history, whether we like it or not. So we have to also be aware of that, and that should be part and parcel of the fieldwork experience. You should be designing interventions with that in mind, especially if you serve a lot of um, individuals that are not, you know, not represented very well. Thank you. I really appreciate some of these suggestions of how when we're out in treatment to be creative and to you know, really look at the individual. Um, but I want to bring the top conversation a little bit back to each one of you and your personal experiences. Uh, you know, I think as clinicians, we do our best to look at someone as an individual, to think about culture, um, but we are also people, and um, just the way living in society, you develop personal implicit biases, whether it was way, the way people treated you or in the way that you're, you know, maybe the way you were raised, your family thought a certain way, so then you just kind of, it just kind of became a part of your subconscious, um, and they do come out, so I, my question to you is, is there a time when you realized that one of your personal implicit biases was affecting treatment? And what steps did you take to overcome that? So, so I'll start off by saying, I, I can't think of a specific situation, just because I'm old, my memory's bad. Um, but of course it has. <laughs> so the, one of the key things about being culturally effective is understanding who you are as a provider. And, you're, and we all are human beings, we all have biases, which means there are preferences. A bias is not necessarily negative, it can be a positive or a negative thing. I happen to like Diet Coke better, I mean Diet Pepsi better than Diet Coke. That's a bias, that's a preference, but it's not a big deal unless you happen to be a Coke stockholder and feel like cutting into your profit. But there are other biases that can be very, very dangerous, right? If I said I don't work with anybody from this country, that can be very dangerous. So every clinician has to be aware of what things you bring to the table in terms of your biases, likes and dislikes. And as people, we all have them, no matter how smart you are, how many degrees you have, how much education. So I suggest going through a process of constantly thinking about who you are, self-awareness, introspection, in terms of what issues you may have related to culture that can compromise your effectiveness in a clinical situation. Uh, for example, uh, I always give the example of what if a guy comes in to receive counseling services from me and he comes in with a KKK role boy? And I, it's obvious that he's in the KKK. I'm already compromised as a clinician, personally. Because um, I just know that's a bias that I have. I don't, don't too much like people in that organization, so I'm not gonna be able to, be, to give him my best effort as a clinician. So what do I do? I do the ethical thing. He still deserves a good service. 
I just can't give it to him, so I'm going to refer him to the next person. But I know that's a bias I have. The other biases I don't know that I have. But the only way I can find out what they are is to be constantly vigilant and introspective and thinking about my own self-awareness to identify those things that may contraindicate me being a great clinician in a given situation. So every clinician has a responsibility to do that on a regular basis. There's some questions you can ask yourself, such as, is this a bias? Is it a bias that's dangerous? Is it a bias that's amenable to change? If it can be changed, then work on it. Not all biases can be changed. If it can't be changed, how are you going to minimize it so it doesn't get in the way of your success as a clinician? Always think about that. And speaking of biases, and I'll get send this guy, you guys this book if you want it. Here's a book that I wrote five years ago called the, We're All Racist, The Truth About Cultural Bias. The book's really about cultural bias. And uh, I have some um, steps in here about identifying cultural bias. And going back to our previous question, things you can do as a person to see how diverse your world is. I have a little survey in here that you can take yourself that tells you whether or not you are actually living a life that's homogeneous in terms of basically hanging around people who are just like you or whether you are pushing the boundaries and stepping out and being able to interface with people who are a little bit different from you. So if anybody wants this book, send me an email, I'll send you a PDF of it, no charge to you. Uh, Thank so you, I'm not promoting this to make money, but I want you there. Chapter two in here is all about bias. Mm -hmm. it, talks, it goes all the way back to Piaget and cognitive schemas and subjective reality and those kinds of things to really break down why it is as human beings we can't avoid being biased because we're all going to be biased no matter what. And so you've got to figure out how you're going to control that and identify those issues for you so that in your clinical practice, they don't become a problem. That's my copy, though. This, and this is her copy, right? Can I answer that question? Yeah, good. Okay. Right. So, dirty laundry time. Okay. Okay. How, has, how have I been biased in my <laughs> professional life? Um, early on, when I, was, when I first started at Kings County, I was a bedside therapist, and then I was rotated into inpatient rehab. Um, and one of my first patients was a, a gentleman. He was from mainland China. He had a car accident, which resulted in central cord syndrome. Um, and, you know, in your mind, you like to think, oh, you know, I'm a culturally competent person and I'm open minded and et cetera. Let's remind ourselves that as OTs, we like questionnaires, but we also like performance based assessments. So, on performance, am I actually that person? That's what I found out. So, People that work with spinal cord injuries, you know that there is a very complex process of accepting your new level of disability, and there's even like a developmental uh, stage theory be, uh, between the clinician um, and the client that you're working with that travels almost as if like a person's development, developing as a, you know, from a baby to a fully grown adult. And one of the phases that we encountered ourselves in, he's been, he was, in, he was in, the, in the acute care for two weeks, we got to this phase. So we got to, you know, we did ADLs, we, we were working on transfers, but so much that towards that end, when he was so focused on his new level of disability and then he became very res resistant, I hate using that word, but we'll get there, resistant towards using new devices or new ways to do things, we got to that place where it was almost impossible for me to work with him because he would be so angry with me and he didn't under I didn't understand and even though I used an interpreter, that didn't matter. I really didn't understand. So I took a step back and I just said, what is going on here? So his, his daughter was there and I asked him, we just started having open the kind of conversation towards the end of the session. So I just stayed extra time. And he kept pointing towards his feet and I didn't understand what was going on. And the interpreter was trying to, was basically telling me it's about, it's about where, 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 I'm, where, my, where the energy is going. And that's when I found out that part of his treatment is not just our Western medicine, but also traditional Chinese medicine. And I didn't understand how important that was to his recovery. I didn't understand how different it was from the way that we understand disability, the way we understand um, what healing is. Uh, and I had to basically relearn ex everything for how I was gonna treat him. Instead of focused on this, we have to restore, we have to compensate, we have to adapt. I had to figure out how to work within the things that were important to him. So I spent a lot of my sessions after that, instead of being client-centered, it was client-led. He ran the sessions and I modified where needed and then provided reflection. And after that experience, um, you know, I thought it was so 
Like I felt like I I reached a moment where I had to you know ex tell people that this happened and tell them how I learned and how I had a lot of problems with that. So I did an in service for my job and I explained to them like what happened with me and how the process was. So what I would argue for in terms of if you ha you will encounter this situation, it's not when it's if okay because you know we are all it's it's the name of the book okay. Um, <laughs> so because of that reason, I I thought it's important to reflect and also to try to do something with that knowledge. So doing the in-service and talking more with my colleagues and talking more with his family and using that knowledge in a way that's gonna help me for the future. So when you encounter a situation like that, humble yourself and go forward and make new knowledge out of it, yeah. Can I just reiterate that? Don't be afraid to look, listen, and learn. You will be put back to zero. That means you face a clinical situation or any kind of situation in a clinical setting where all your knowledge and expertise and experience doesn't help you that much. Where you have to learn anew. And thankfully, you're a lifelong learner, and thankfully you have a lot of tools at your fingertips that allow you to get up to speed quickly, like what? At your fingertips. Google. Google, Google. right, right. I used to tell my kids all the time, my kids, you know, when they were younger, Dad, you're, you're an educator, a professor, there are things that you don't know. I said, are you kidding me? I said, not a day goes by in my life, even today, where something doesn't come up where I'm put back to zero, meaning I need to know this much about it, and I really know this much. Not just in terms of cultural diversity, but everything. I'm supposed to know this much, I know this much. Every single day it happens in 38 years of work. Get used to it. You'll be humble. Don't be afraid of being put back to zero. Just scramble, look, listen, learn, do a search, talk to your colleague, check a reference book, talk to an old supervisor, whatever you got to do to learn. Quick, quickly. So one thing I'd like to add, thank you for, for sharing that, is so you, meet, you may meet one patient, and this patient was Chinese? Yeah, mainland China. Mainland China, who, for him, this is important, mm -hmm. But we have to be careful that we don't assume that every other patient you meet from mainland China, that this will be a concern. So that's the, I think that's the challenge with trying to be culturally competent is that we may try to memorize and learn facts about individual cultures, and that's virtually impossible, right? So it's really understanding what is important, and, I, and, I, and that's what you did, to find, to, you listened. You took a step back and you said, what, what, what is it that I'm not understanding? Not, not so much what is it that you can't explain, right? Not what's wrong with you, but what is it that I'm not understanding? And, and you took a step back to, and, and you, you understood what was important to him, right? So we really have to individualize our approach to patient rather than treating patients as cultures, because if we do, then we run into the, we run the risk of stereotyping and assuming that the next patient that you see, this may apply to them. Right? So it's really valuing and respecting and looking at a person as an individual and their culture, yes, it may add to your ability to treat them and understanding of it, but it does not necessarily apply to everyone. So it's taking a step back and listening to people and, empathi and, and empathy, demonstrating, you know, um, I, I see that there's something that, there's something else that you would like me to do. And you talk to their family members. Um, so it's, when we try to understand cultures, that's the danger, but really understanding the individual. And you guys, I told you about the three-dimensional model tool. That's what that's designed for, you to get to know the person in front of you, not the group. Um, one of the reasons why we um, send students to uh, different clinical sites is uh, to at least come in contact with uh, patients from different uh, sociocultural backgrounds. And um, most times, students may want to go to uh, one site where everyone tells them, oh, it's easy. Uh, those patients are really easy to deal with, and, uh, rather than experience the difficult you know, patients. And it takes uh, some years to actually become very comfortable. So I don't want anyone to think they can uh, become culturally you know, competent the first time that you see a patient or the first time that someone challenges, you know, you. I, 26 years ago, I used to speak with a thicker accent than I do now. And uh, I remember my first job uh, it was uh, a problem um, with patients 
my first job was at my manager's medical center. As nice as those patients were, you know, initially, you know, they were like, okay, so what are you? I had my ID, I had my, you know, lab coat and everything. I said, well, I am one of the PAs. But it takes an approach to get over, you know, to, get, to make patients to become comfortable. And I think uh, one of the first things that any one of us can do, even with patients that are a little bit, is to make them comfortable. And once you break down that barrier, they are going to, you know, hold you up as like, uh, you know, the very best person, even if they had their, you know, prejudices or anything, you know, going. So we have to be comfortable, and that's one of, uh, uh, I think, the factors of becoming professionals and not really, you know, take things personal. You know, we have to be in the moment, you know, represent, uh, understand that we are representing ourselves as professionals. And uh, over time, it becomes easier, and it becomes easier. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you know, you guys brought up such important points about looking at the individual and our approach and also taking time to do that self-reflection. Because if you don't take that time, then we'll miss those things where understanding like, oh, he's coming from a different philosophy, the energy is going to his feet. Now, how do we use that during our treatment? Um, so I really thank you for bringing those up. Um, you know, we talk about the individual, and one thing that I really do love about these upcoming generations, our audience out here, is that they think about identity and they fight for identity. Um, and I really appreciate that in various movements. And one movement is the Me Too movement. And with that movement, you know, it has, you know, gotten a lot of publicity and there's been some strong voices and, I, and that's been out there in the political scene. But I do want to ask you if you've seen it come into healthcare. Has the Me Too movement made changes in how healthcare is delivered or how you think about treatment? I think movements is a, is a natural human behavior, and they happen whenever there's something is off for a long time that no one's talking. So they become a wake-up call to society. I wish we had the same movement. I would like, personally, I didn't see the same movement or like like a, a movement that is similar in impact on diversity and healthcare. Uh, I would love to see a positive movement happening that way, but the uh, the movement itself. I feel um, impacted members of healthcare in being more careful, being more perceptive, and uh, be better listeners. And although the context is a little bit different, uh, they still have the same uh, purpose and function to pay attention to the other and be uh, cognizant of how you're coming across and what else am I not, you know, paying attention of. Uh, my body language, you know, how I treat people, what I say. So I think this is contagious to other behaviors, like um, how we stereotype people. Uh, now we're being more careful. Uh, what pronouns you use. Now this is, you know, we're very careful now. And careful is good. Careful is good. Careful is res uh, respectful. And I feel this is what I take away from that. Um, always that cultural humility, always listen to the person in front of you, not to yourself, to your own thoughts, and see like, you know, how you come across to people. I think uh, one of uh, the very good things that uh, the Me Too movement has brought to healthcare is uh, awareness on the part of patients. And um, I remember as uh, a new PA, a newly graduated PA, I took a job with a group in Farakaway in Queens. And uh, my attending asked me, oh, Felix, did they teach you guys how to do uh, pelvic exams uh, in PA school? I said, yeah. I said, okay, well, you know, I need you to take care of uh, you know, female patients who need, uh, you know, routine exams or who have complaints. I said, are you really sure? He said, yeah. Now, the first day that I had patients lined up, I came in uh, to the clinic, and there were like 20, you know, women. I broke out in sweat. I mean, I uh, <laughs> went back, and I spoke with uh, the LPN, and I went by the book, and I told her how to prep uh, 
uh, the examining room, you know, what to do. And I call in, uh, we call in the first patient. And I asked them if they knew what, you know, why they were getting a, um, a perfect exam. You know, half the patients didn't know why they were getting a perfect exam. And uh, half the patients didn't need a perfect exam. And uh, half the patients have not been taught through a perfect exam by the physician. They basically go to a clinic, get put on the examining table, covered with drip, they don't see who is doing the exam, and it's done. So I spoke to them, I told them what was going on, you know, why uh, the patients who didn't, I said they didn't need it, you know, and uh, the ones who did, I explained uh, with LPN exactly the process, you know, and uh, the steps, what it meant, and uh, at every inch of the way, uh, I explained what was going on. And, uh, by the next week, I had more patients coming to the clinic, you know, because no one had actually bothered to talk to them in a way that they explained. And now, once you know you're right, now you can, you know, um, as a female patient, um, you can know when someone is abusive. And I think that's one of the good things that came out of, not the only thing, uh, as far as, you know, um, uh, healthcare, you know, goes. It's just knowing you're right and being aware of when someone is doing something that is improper, you know, basically. And I think that's a point um, that I've, you know, learned from this. Thank you. And I, I think for when it comes to patients' care, um, that there's been more attention to making sure that um, there is someone else to chaperone and um, discussing everything that you're doing with the patient. But I think with the, um, but in, despite that, there are still some, you know, egregious acts that have been reported with patients going to see an ER doctor and ending up, you know, just for a broken shoulder and, you know, they were molested, right? So um, we've all heard about that. Um, with the, I, 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 I think what the Me Too movement is also doing is looking at um, sexual misconduct um, between students and faculty and really abusing um, the privilege of a, being a faculty to get a student, male or female, to do something that you want um, with the threat holding a grade, right? And that's something that we haven't really discussed that we need to do more. And, and it's subtle. It may be more um, not overt sexual misconduct, but it may be um, rubbing someone's shoulders or leaning against someone, making someone uncomfortable. And when they move away, you know, what's wrong with her? You know, she's off puttish and, and all of a sudden that goes in your letters of recommendation. So I think we need to do more about that um, because as, as, as learners, um, you are vulnerable to being taken advantage of, right? And, and the risk of not saying something and, you know, I, I I think it would be naive of me to say that nothing has ever happened um, in a clinical setting, but students may be reluctant to say something because this is my grade, this is my rotation, I'm going into this field. So more needs to be done, really, that this is not tolerated. Um, I know SUNY actually has a sexual misconduct, sexual discrimination policy, um, and, and I think there's a course that everyone has to take. Um, so more discussion has to be on that, you know, just the, the everyday um, interactions that make someone uncomfortable, yet they fear saying something because it may cost them their grade. So I think we need to talk more about that. I think what, you know, what you're talking about is creating that safe environment for our clients, for our students. And, you know, that our clients, we could talk about how they are vulnerable. and. Our students are in that position as well. And so I do want to bring up another population, the LGBTQ plus population. Um, there has been research that show that like 38.5%, which is a pretty high number um, of indi individuals who are going to school said that their sexual orientation uh, impacted them negatively because they felt discriminated against. So what do you feel like programs, schools, um, universities can do to um, help them feel safer, to help them feel not discriminated against, and to foster a safe environment for, for LGBTQ people? 
Well, I think as as well, as, as you mentioned, really creating that that safe mm -hmm. environment, um, making sure that students can come, students and faculty. Actually, there's a place where students and faculty can go. Um, in the curriculum, you know, so we talk a lot about diversity, but we also have to talk about inclusion, right? So there really isn't true diversity unless it's inclusive, because you can have numbers and say, well, we're going to make sure that we have different people, different groups, but the culture has not changed, the environment has not changed, and people still feel isolated. Um, and while they're a part of an institution, they're in the institution, but they're not really a part of it. So I think um, an inclusive environment um, changing, using language that's not stigmatizing, right? We still say things that are really offensive um, because we make assumptions, right? We make assumptions. We look at someone and they say, surely you're not, and then you say something, right? right? Um, nowadays, it would be hard for someone to say the N-word, maybe, maybe not, I don't know, and when you're speaking to someone, but how often do we use slurs that are very offensive to the LGBTQ community without even thinking it? You know, like, like this dude is, or she must be, right? So we have to be very um, intentional to make sure that um, we don't use language that's stigmatizing, that we don't make assumptions. Um, and in our curriculum, the curriculum really has to reflect like, yeah, this is truly an inclusive environment. Um, learning about transgender health, right? Because it's not, because it's the right thing to do, because it's the, th it's the important thing to do. You may save someone's life. You don't want to miss a, cancer, a diagnosis of cancer because you don't know what um, someone's gender identity is, yeah. right? So, it's, um, so I, 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 you know, again, it, 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 there's a lot more work that needs to be done, but having these conversations is really important. Um, we have just enough time for um, questions from the audience, but before um, we end and we take questions, I want each one of you to provide the audience members um, just one tip that you would leave them with or one challenge um, to, to be able to provide better health care um, when they're out there. Well, for um, PAs, um, one of the challenges that a lot of PAs uh, you know, have, especially those who, a lot of PAs want to uh, work in the ED uh, setting. And um, the experience has shown that that environment can actually blunt the sensitivities of, the sensitivities of uh, you know, clinicians um, to the point that uh, there is a herd mentality whereby the patients, especially poor patients or minority patients, uh, can become the enemy and uh, are always, uh, you know, suspect. Um, so just be aware of, you know, your, you know, sensibilities and sensitivities when I'm handling with patients and never get to the point that you lose that because now you run the risk of getting into real problems, you know, that has implications on your you know, ability to practice and, you know, licensure and all that. So that's just a warning. And again, you don't become a pro three months into it. Mm -hmm. You become a pro by making a purposeful, you know, effort to be the best you can be, you know, and take uh, note of uh, all the factors that, uh, you know, make you a good professional, a good clinician. And I'm sure this applies to OTs and everyone else. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Felix. Uh, well, thank, again, thanks again for having this, this conversation. Um, so last words. I, I would say um, valuing people for who they are, valuing human beings, and respect and value. Um, a lot of times things are done to people, people of color, um, members of our LGBTQ community, uh, people with different levels of ability, because there's just a lack of value. You know, we assign or ascribe a value to them that's different from what we would assign to ourselves. We see them as the others, right? So therefore, it's okay to treat them that way because they're the others. And when you do that, you run the risk of making medical errors, you know, contributing to um, poor health outcomes and um, just well-being. So I think it starts from just valuing life, valuing individuality, valuing people for who they are, right? And difference is okay. You know, and if we think about it, we're, probably, we're more similar than we are different, but, if, but that's an opportunity. I think we're all here because we love people, 
right? At least that's what people wrote on their applications, right? <laughs> right? right? So if, if, if you do truly love human beings, then you should value human beings and value who they are um, and start with respect, really respecting others. And Dr. Taylor says, Tanya Taylor says, not treating others, was it do unto others as you would have them un do unto you. Don't treat people like you would want to be treated. Treat them like they would want to be treated. That was Dr. Tanya Taylor in the School of Medicine. <laughs> she said that. Um, so. Thank you. I want to thank you guys for inviting me. I was very surprised. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to give you specific advice for new grad OT students because when you become a new graduate, you are out of the nest. You are alone. You are away from your friends unless you get lucky enough. I'm scaring you on purpose, okay? <laughs> OT school is super jolly. I'm sorry, guys. So, and most of us won't have mentors, unfortunately, with the way the market looks out there. And you're going to find yourself trying so hard to be a good therapist and just be competent, like, or maybe just not hurt anyone. Like your level of what you wanna accomplish just grows slower and lower and lower that first year. <laughs> and you just wanna get through the day, but keep the connections you have now, if you have them, and keep connections you have with professors because they're, you're going to encounter situations that you're going to, they're very specific to your work situation, but you're not gonna have anyone to really talk about that. Keep your friendships and your connections in OT school and try to informally um, reflect on what's been going on day to day in your new grad experiences because all of the things that I told, shared with you guys, I was lucky enough to have those moments because of my WhatsApp group chat, that's why. Um, and we went back and forth trading treatment interventions and we shared with each other. I was comfortable with this group to tell them what was going on with my life. And they were honest enough to tell me the truth. And then we, you know, we shared articles. One of them said, email Don, or, you know, things like that. So, uh, <clears throat> so, you know, keep those friendships there and challenge yourself to reflect every week and figure out what you can do better. And part of that reflection is figuring out where you went wrong and figuring out how you can do better. Um, so concretely, keep your groups, reflect every week, reach out to your professors, keep doing research, do not let your AOTA subscription lapse because you will use it, and that's why, okay? Thank you. So two things. One, do not suffer from destination disease as it relates to culture. Don't make the mistake that cultural competency sort of implies and, and sort of urges you to do, which is to feel like you reach a point where you are culturally competent. You will never reach a point where you're culturally competent, which is why I like the concept of cultural efficacy, because it means that you're constantly striving to get better and learn about culture. You never reach a destination. So don't suffer from destination disease. Your quest to work well with different cultures is a lifelong quest, and you have to do it for the rest of your life, your professional life. The second thing is relationship is key. And this, I only have two things. Relationship is key. I know from the counseling literature and the research that the single most important thing in a helper, service recipient relationship, from a counselor's point of view, I'm not sure about OT and, and PA in terms of literature, but I think it's probably the same, is the strength of the alliance between the client and the therapist. Mm -hmm. When they have strong rapport, positive relationship, it really doesn't matter what interventions you do, you can make some mistakes culturally, but if that relationship is strong, mm -hmm. you have a lot of wiggle room and get a lot of forgiveness. So one of the things you've got to learn how to do is to build that therapeutic bond early on because then you can get the person to tell you all the things you don't know about Great. what it takes to work with them. And in the end, they'll see you as a very competent and a very culturally efficacious mm -hmm. therapist. Thank you. Um, I would say um, my tip to you is um, if you see something, say something. If you have to be vocal about issues that comes to diversity, um, we will not feel, uh, we will not reach the, the point of equilibrium when it comes to diversity unless we all feel comfortable talking about it and, and until we um, all feel that we belong to the uh, healthcare setting, to the program that you're studying in. So if you see something that is not, um, is, is not to your benefit, whether it's like your uh, group or to your client's group, say something, be vocal about it, be advocate to your client and be advocate to yourself. 
you, you, you owe it to yourself to advocate your own diversity, your own background, and also for your client. And don't, don't feel um, um, limited when it comes to that. You have to, to show yourself, you have to present yourself. It's your right to defend your diversity, it's your right to show it, to be present. So be vocal about it. It's my tip to you. Mm -hmm. Just one thing. Just one thing. And also, if, also, if you see s something being said to, um, about a client or a colleague, say something. Because that person may not feel that they're in a position to say um, something. Um, but if, if there's an opportunity for you to speak up on someone else's behalf, you know, Dr. Lewis, this is something that I observed. This is what happened to one of our students, and it bothered me, and I wanted to bring this to your attention, or this is what I heard that was said about a patient. So be each other's advocates. Mm -hmm. I agree, you're right. Advocate for yourself, advocate for your clients, but, um, you know, be an advocate for, for, your, for your classmates also. Speak up. Speak up. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for those insightful suggestions. I hope that you guys are able to hold on to them as you move forward in becoming practitioners and, and your group of friends, hold on to those too because they'll be very, very valuable in the future. Um, I am gonna open up the floor to the audience if they have any, if you guys have any questions or comments. Um, is there a mic that will be going around? Good, there's a question in the back. Hi, um, so my question may come out like a little jumbled because I'm working through it as I'm talking, mm -hmm. but you guys spoke a lot about like advocating if you see something happen to someone else that makes you uncomfortable. But let's say you're in like as a field work student and you see a supervisor saying something about like patients that make you uncomfortable. How can you approach your supervisor if they know that they're not being like culturally competent or ethical, and they don't actually care because they feel like they're away from the patient. So you want to tackle that one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I was actually going to share this, but I, it wasn't a fieldwork supervisor. It was a fieldwork supervisor's colleague, and she was one of the... the when my supervisor was absent, she was the person that took over and that she was my supervisor. And we were all writing notes and this person made a joke about uh, patients, undocumented patients. And you know, she thought that I was like on my computer doing my thing, writing my notes, trying to get out of there on time. And I really didn't know what to say because as a fieldwork student, you're basically taught, get through the 12 weeks. It doesn't matter if you're tortured. <laughs> like, Sorry, Jasmine, but. <laughs> I want you guys to graduate. <laughs> I, you will graduate. Um, but I honestly, I just started engaging the conversation. I just asked the question, what's that supposed to mean? That's it. And sometimes when you repeat back the things, the very things that people say that are problematic, you just literally word for word, and then you say, you say it like, you know, blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. And then the person gradually is like, oh, they're recognizing like, oh, I said something bad. And oh, I shouldn't have said this. And I really shouldn't have said this in front of this person. And I'm going to be in pro trouble now. Um, even if you're a student and you have zero authority, you have moral authority. That's it. I would, I would also add to that, um, you should never accept cultural intolerance. Once you recognize it, um, call it up, and uh, also, of course, be prudent. Choose your words wisely, but call it up, because if everyone, um, if each one of us, you know, saw something and didn't say anything, and they did recognize that as cultural intolerance, then we're still in the problem, and we're not going to solve it. So um, once you recognize that it's it's not uh, um, a slip, it's actually intolerance and it's very clear and you can, as, as uh, my colleague said, you can use your words to, as proof, then um, call it up. Mm -hmm. Speak and up. 
Um, you know, I, it is very difficult to be a fieldwork student, but all throughout your career, you will be in a vulnerable position because there might be a supervisor who says something and this might be your first job. That you might still be in probation or, you know, you know your supervisor likes to wield their power. Um, so I think what, you know, what is being said up, up here is that you could say something, it's your approach. So even if you need to take a step back because you're upset or angry, Take the time so then later on you could approach them calmly. And if you just ask them, oh, I was uncertain what you meant by this, and then I think most of them will be reflective and be able to say, oh, I didn't mean that. Hopefully that's going to be their answer. If not, that opens up a discussion, a bigger discussion um, of what that topic is. So yeah, throughout your career, you will be experiencing this. So you know, practice definitely makes perfect in this. And diplomacy is key. Mm -hmm. yeah. Be the diplomatic attack. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask if, uh, during your time uh, in your clinical careers, if you found that your race, your ethnicity, your gender was a barrier to providing effective care because you found that your client wasn't receiving you well, and how you adapted to that in treating patients in the future or in the moment, and um, how, you over how you overcome that in your career in general. Wow. So for me, I've never had that experience. Maybe I was just oblivious to it, but I never knew yeah. that was what was going on, which is probably good. Um, and, uh, but if I did know, and I, I would address it directly, tactfully, diplomatically, and work hard to get that person to a different clinician that they can connect with. I'm a firm believer that all of us can't, can't serve everybody equally effective. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, you know, I know it's hard with tight resources, but sometimes you've got to know when it's the ethical thing to do is to refer that person to somebody else where there's a better connection. Either your bias is getting in the way or their bias is getting in the way of them working with you. So you have to know when it's time to sort of cut your losses and say, okay, this is a no-win no -win situation, and I'm going to do the ethical thing, which, you know, think about beneficence, what's in their best interests, interest, and refer them to the next person who may not have the same issue, or they may not have the same issue with that person. That's, that's my take. Um, I, I had that happen to me, um, and it's interesting, I, I just had a, a, taught a class to um, our first year students. Um, so I remember um, um, an incident when I was, um, I was the attending, I was the attending, um, so we were going on, on work rounds and um, there was a patient who, every time we walked down the hall, she would start singing Kumbaya. And then as we got closer, she said, wow, look at this. Isn't it just like the model UN? Um, you have your black, you have your white. And I was the only black person on the team. And every day for like a week, kumbaya, we'd walk down the hall, model UN, you know, I should march with you. What flag should I bring? And I went in, hi, how are you doing? You know, any pain, what's going on? And she said, okay, let us know if there's anything we can do. I was hurting inside. I was like, just, just. Like, I can't wait till I discharge you. Um, and, but I, I, I chose, um, you know, I was the senior, I was the attending, right? Um, and, no, no, I'm sorry, it was me. I was the senior resident. Sorry, I was the senior resident. Um, and it, it, it hurt me. It hurt me to the core. So then um, she was discharged, and I'm like, thank God, right? But I said nothing. It was a decision that I made that um, if I said something, I don't know how it would have came out, it, how, how it would come out honestly, because I was so hurt, right? I was beyond angry, I was hurt. And, um, and usually when I get um, hurt, I cry. And I'm like, I can't cry, you know, at this moment. You know, I gotta keep cool, Dr. Boone Foster. So then the last day, kumbaya, look at this model you went, she was discharged, we're like, oh yeah, you're thankful, thankfully. And then a student came to me, and I don't remember his first name, his last name is Bell, so he's Dr. Bell. He was a fourth year medical student, um, white male student who came up to me and said, Dr. Budin Foster, that was horrible. I can't believe she did that. That was wrong. And every time we went in there, I wanted to say something, but I didn't know what to say. And I'm sorry this happened to you. That's when I cried. That's when I went home and I just cried and cried because it's not so much what she said because you can't change people, you know, and, and you have to pick and choose your battles. And for me, that wasn't my battle. You know, I'm here to, I, was, I saw myself as treating what condition she had, but I couldn't, you know, I, I can't cure racism. That was not my battle. That's the decision that I made. 
But what was hurtful was that no one else said anything, right? But when that student came to me, that's when I said, oh my goodness, someone heard, someone listened. So diplomacy, decide when you have to say something. Um, the mistake that I did was I didn't talk to anyone else. I, I don't even think I shared that with my husband. It was just so painful. Talking to other people, don't tweet, don't text, <laughs> don't put it on Facebook, but talking, sharing your pain with someone else. And if you decide to say something, do it with diplomacy. And again, remember that you are, you're the provider. You know, this is the patient. Um, and, 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 you, and first do no harm, right? That's, 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 our, that's our philosophy. Um, but if you decide to say something, you have to be careful. Unfortunately, you do have to be careful with how you respond to situations. And there is an article, um, New England Journal of Medicine had an article that was, I mean, it was called Dealing with the Racist Patients. Um, so there's a lot of literature on this. So you have to respond to it in a way that elevates you. And if I had to do it again, I would probably do the same thing, go in, treat her, because that modeled professionalism. Mm -hmm. Right? How are you? You know, and then leaving, and then teaching the students. But I would have spoken to someone. I would have spoken to a colleague, honestly. But that's just me personally. And you know, I think the point. A few of you brought up the point of um, advocating. We also have a responsibility to advocate for our colleagues if they cannot do it themselves because it might cause too much, you know, drama. But someone else can advocate for you, and then it'll be like a little bit, it'll be received a little bit more. So make sure you protect your colleagues like that. Little, you a, become a family. This was a student wow. who did this. Mm -hmm. You know, this was a student. Um, I don't know what became of him, but I know he went to Penn, <laughs> um, internal medicine, and this was a student who, who said think, it was wrong. You have to do whatever's comfortable for you. So I'm more direct, and I would probably go in and say, you keep notice you keep saying kumbaya, what do you mean by that? <laughs> oh, model that's, you that's, 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 that's what that's I would okay, say. Yeah. I'd say, model you okay, what does that mean? The power of what do you mean by that? <laughs> but you have to do what, what suits your style. Yeah. I, I, that's sort of my style. What do you feel comfortable like, with? Yeah. 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 Are there any other questions or comments from the audience? There's one here and then one there. Hi. Um, so, oh my goodness, my question just floated out of my head. Um, so you guys were, oh. I got it back. So you guys were talking a lot about, you know, advocating for your colleagues and, you know, for, you know, the people around you. But what about for the patient that is unaware? So you told the story of, you know, the, the clinician that went back and was saying all these things to other people who you know have these biases, but that patient that they're dealing with is unaware. You know, is there something you feel like Obviously, I don't think you can talk to the patient about this, but it's like you know that this person is dealing with something and holds these biases and holds, you know, these negative thoughts per se about their patient, and now they're dealing with their patient and may not be providing the best level of care. How would you deal with a situation like that, you know, advocating for that patient? Um, so I do this for all of my patients. When I first meet them, I'm a bedside therapist. When I first meet them, I tell them what I'm going to do, who I am, and do they consent? And then I ask for consent every time. And I, before I leave, I always tell them, you're the most important member of the team. You, anytime you want us to stop this, this evaluation of the session, you let me know, I'll walk on out of here. So I know that that's, that doesn't answer the direct question, but by making patients really, really, really empowered, really empowered to call things out and to kind of have a little bit of like when, you know, we depersonalize patients in the hospital, we put them in a gown, they're naked, they have cath in them, suddenly they're not people anymore, they're specimens. So you treat them as, you know, the main leader of the medical team. Mm -hmm. And maybe by doing that, I don't know, institutionally, people are going to be a little bit less inclined to say comments like that. Because are you going to make a comment like that about your boss, basically? No. Make your patients your boss. Um, I'd, I'd like to add to that, in addition to educating your patient and keeping them informed and empowered, but also sometimes up to the uh, obvious solutions. If you feel that there is a pattern, let's say there is a consistent person who always makes these comments or always comes across as offensive or whatever the problem is, and if you recognize that pattern or that person, maybe addressing that person um, would take care of the problem going forward. 
So it's not only you should educate the patient himself, uh, him or herself, but also where is the problem? Uh, remove the problem, whether it's a person who's consistently showing these, uh, making these remarks, or uh, a context, a special context, or uh, a specific unit or a clinic. Uh, maybe sometimes we have to highlight the problem, that this is a problem, this person is problematic. The remarks they make is problematic. So it's not only important that you empower one person, you also have to eradicate the problem uh, in whatever means uh, suitable. I think um, one of my attendings did something that, was, uh, that I consider very profound. When the new uh, team of PAs that were hired, so he asked every one of us to tell them who we are. And uh, actually to write down, you know, who we were. It wasn't in terms of your name, you know, birth, or where you live. To really tell them what kind of person, you know, that you were. So, and I think uh, each one of us, uh, you know, told them that, you know, we, like personally, I told them that if I saw something, then I would say something. And uh, I recounted my background. I spent four years in a seminary. Um, and uh, my graduate degree is in biomedical ethics. And uh, let me know that I'm always looking out, you know, for a patient. And um, that I am very vocal without being confrontational. So he shouldn't expect me to uh, uh, not say anything. And uh, I think he did appreciate, you know, that. And I think there was a reason why he was asking all of us to actually describe who we were as professionals. Um, if anyone of you guys, uh, you know, has a job, it's very important at the beginning for your colleagues to know who you are. You know, that will really prevent a whole lot of things. The way they talk to you, the way they talk around you, you know, the way they talk uh, to patients, you know, in front of you. And um, once you've established your reputation, your reputation all, often goes before you. And uh, people know who you are that you've not even met. You know, if you go from bedside to a different floor, uh, people, you know, ask you, oh, are you this? I say, yeah, did I do anything wrong? Say, no, 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 we've heard about you. So mm -hmm. your reputation that you ought to establish at the beginning of your professional careers, at least in a place that you intend to last in you know, a long time, does matter. Uh, if you begin by becoming one of the boys or the girls and talking like one of the boys or the girls, it's a little bit harder to find religion at some point and then just change. So that's one thing that I'll you know, tell everyone who's beginning uh, you know, their careers in, in healthcare. Thank you. We have time for one more question and then Braxton will come up with closing remarks. So I just have a question about admissions to healthcare programs. Obviously, if you want to have a more diverse healthcare body of practitioners, it starts with diversity within the programs themselves. So I know that you mentioned earlier just how you don't really want to have diversity in a way that's just like checking off boxes of having certain numbers of ethnicities. I guess that like relates to affirmative action. I know there's a lot of controversy about that, but if you're not paying attention to race or ethnicity and you want to find diversity other ways, like how do you make sure that you still do get diversity that covers so many different areas? Like, should you be paying attention to those things? Should you be considering those? Um, yeah, I remember once doing an um, information session and uh, one of the students, one of the prospective students uh, that attended asked after we laid out that we recruit a class that mirrors, you know, Brooklyn, you know, to begin with, uh, mirrors, uh, you know, New York, uh, since we're, you know, since school. And uh, that we look out for the best amongst, um, you know, applicant pool. So she asked, does that mean that you're going to accept a black student over me? I said, no. I said, nine times out of 10, any student that is accepted over you is more qualified than you. So um, the key thing is this. Most times we look at one index of uh, the admissions in the process. Uh, for example, I'll tell you that we, um, I, I don't mean my program. I mean, I've sat in, um, on the 
academic standings committee where an admissions are reviewed. So most times you can have a student who performed very well in their sciences, the prerequisite courses, but who somehow didn't do well in a GRE. And uh, that becomes, you know, the block. And uh, you can have a student who thanked their bio in freshman, but then, you know, did well on the upper level sciences in the same uh, competitive uh, academic institution. But to get beyond that C or C minus, you know, becomes, you know, problematic. Um, so we talk about, um, um, what is it? Uh, ah, what is the term? Um, drawn blank. Um, holistic admissions, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, that is often a misnomer, you know, for looking at, uh, you know, intangibles. But there are a lot of things that can tell you how competitive a candidate is. I'll give you a frank example. So we have uh, a student, our cutoff is a GPA of uh, 3.0. So we have a student who went to Sony Stony Brook, majored in bio neuroscience, and somehow advisement, which happens in college, undercuts the performance of a lot of students across the board. So I'm looking at this guy's uh, transcript. He's doing genetics in, fr in his freshman year. And uh, long story short, by the time he graduates with so many sciences. His total GPA is 2.95. But he did really well in his uh, you know, junior and senior you know, years. But his GPA doesn't meet the cutoff. So what are we going to do? If we focus on the cutoff GPA, while this student or candidate has really demonstrated they can carry 21 credits and do well, and then we look at a different candidate who took one or two science semester and a course load, got all A's. We've shown over the years that that student that finished with a GPA of 2.9 carrying a load of 18 to 21 credits actually outperforms the other students. But most programs may not want to you know, look at things like that. Actually take time. Oh, okay, so let me give a chance and then see what happens. If it doesn't work out, then you know, we're wrong. And nine times out of 10 that we've done that, we've been able to recruit a class that is actually very balanced, that can do the work, and whose minimum GPAs, actually science GPAs, are similar, even if the total GPAs are a little bit you know, different. So there are different criteria. But that process has to be really purpose-driven. And no one who is qualified to get into any class is denied a spot. You know? Most times, uh, people, one of the things that our program has also done is to, for feeder schools that have uh, a high number of um, underrepresented minorities, but whose students come uh, a little bit ill-prepared, We've provided their science or pre-health advisors you know, feedback so that two or three years down the line, those students from the same schools are actually coming in very qualified. It's purpose-driven. So we can't really sit here on campus and say, well, let them prepare their students and uh, make it a difference in uh, the demographics of our students. We have to go, you know, I've spoken to McEvers, uh, New York uh, City Tech, I've gone to Brooklyn College, and um, you know, those schools in the, here in Brooklyn, uh, St. Francis, to tell them, we want your students, but they have to come qualified. No one is cutting them a break. If they don't come qualified, they're not going to do well, and they're going to, you know, drop out or be dismissed. We don't want that. You don't want that. So you front load the work, and it pays off, you know, a few years down the line for them and for us. I think... This is a really good question, and uh, the reason why it's a good question because it's a big problem, and I don't think it's, there's one solution to fix that. 
I think uh, the other side of this problem is not like, are we picking diverse students, but also, do we have a large enough pool of applicants of diverse backgrounds to pick from? The larger that pool is, the more likely we are to pick qualified applicants, because you don't want to fix a problem from one side and start another problem. You don't want to set people to fail. You don't want to accept people who are non-qualified and have them and see them struggle, even with all the support, even with all the push. You don't want to see them struggle. So the larger the pool, the more likely we are to, to end up with a diverse um, um, group. So to fix that pool issue, a lot of, of, of parties also have to uh, chip in. Uh, we need more uh, school counseling, uh, career counselors in high school. We need more outre uh, outreach efforts. So reaching out to uh, uh, colleges of, of um, uh, minority students or underrepresented students our populations, we need to, this is something we could do. We could reach out more. We could increase the awareness of students, maybe something that you're interested in. Do you, have you ever uh, looked up into healthcare or OT or PA? Maybe they don't know that this is a good fit for them. So educating high schoolers, educating uh, undergrad, uh, reaching out more, this is also part of the solution. It doesn't, we get to pick, we get to make the decision by the end of the day as programs, but also we need a pool to pick from uh, and if you end up and this is where we we shoot ourselves in the foot if we are picking people just as I said uh, as I, I, I point, uh, like my opening remark we don't only want a head count we want to make a difference and we want to actually have a diverse uh, student body and it's not just by checking a box okay we have like we have two african-american students we have two Asians we need to stop playing that game we need to actually look at diversity at general and helping these people to be part of this pool. So this is, this is a big problem for a lot of educational programs, not only OTs, and it doesn't stop only by the, the picking process. And it's a big problem in health professions because you know if you go out to the lay community and you say, you talk to a third grader, what is a doctor? That kid can tell you what a doctor is. Mm -hmm. What is a nurse? They can tell you what that is. You say, what is medical informatics, or what's an OT, or what's a PT, or a PA? Clueless, particularly in communities of color. So we have to do a much better job, all of us, including you guys, of going out and making sure that we teach people at a young age about our particular professions, because people don't know about it. When I was at University of Pittsburgh, I remember having a conversation with five, I think, five black female medical students. I forget what we were talking about, something to do with culture. And one of the questions I had for them was, you guys are doing, you ladies are doing great because you're in medical school, but did anybody here think about anything other than medicine in the health field? They said, what else is there? That's what they told me. What else is there? Nurse, pharmacist, dentist, physician. That's what they said. I said, okay. Well, there's some other things, but I understand. You, you'll be great physicians. But that, that proved it to me. People don't know about our professions. And when they're making a decision, uh, about what they want to do, they have to know that OT is an option, or PA is an option, or PT is an option. And we've not done a good enough job of educating the lay community about these options. So we have a lot more work to do. I'm sorry, can I challenge you guys? Because you guys are yes. pretty up here in institutions. Kings County invites high school students during the summer to be um, volunteers in different departments. Um, they do not have a fancy application process where you have to put your GPA and who you know and blah, blah, blah. They go to the local high schools, right around Kings County, right around Flatbush, East Flatbush, and they ask kids to come in. You know, they have to um, put in an essay, and they're allowed in. NYU Rusk, Columbia, no, it's not like that. You have to fill out a very extensive application. You need to show this, you need to show that. Secondly, at the end of this um, summer where they're there, the kids are invited to an open house where people from different professions in the hospital are there to answer your questions. And Everybody wants to go to the, R the RN table. Everyone wants to go to the nurse's table. But they go around each and every table, and the first thing they ask you is, how much you get paid, how much does it cost, how long does it take? Let's not ignore the elephant in the room. OT school is ridiculously expensive, okay? And the cost, the return on investment for it right now is lower than what it was. So you, I have had students during that experience, I never thought about this before, that say to me, well, if I, go to, if I become an RN, I only have to go to school for one year and I'll be making X amount, so why should I become an OT? And the money is a problem, especially when you're a person of a disadvantaged background. So we also have to ask ourselves, well, 
our professional bodies increasing the demands, therefore increasing the schooling, therefore increasing the cost to come in? Are they making it further barriers for students that otherwise wouldn't enter to come in? So you have to acknowledge that. And I say that because of the OTD mandate, okay? That's a big problem. So, um, shameless plug, August, April 4th, um, 2020, we are hosting um, a it's called SWAG, um, Scholars with Athletic Gold, Brooklyn SWAG, and we're inviting high school students who are athletes to come to SUNY Downstate, and the focus is going to be on sports. So we are looking to um, all of our School of Health Profession students to come and support. So these are kids who are interested in, in their athletes um, to introduce them to medicine. Um, and these are students from local high schools, Erasmus, um, Medgarvis Prep, so um, we're, yeah. That's awesome, send out the email. Mm -hmm. I will send out the email. Uh, we are ready to wrap up the evening. It's been wonderful. I really wanna thank all our panelists for just taking their time to provide their insight. <laughs> and Braxton has a few closing remarks before you all leave. I want to thank everyone for coming here today. Uh, I think I can speak for everyone in saying that this was a really valuable experience. Uh, it's amazing to have people from so many different backgrounds and so many different experiences come and uh, talk about things that they've seen, uh, ways that we can improve ourselves as clinicians. Uh, the word empowered came up. I think it's really empowering to see people who are so professional, really amazing, come here in their own time to help us. Um, so I, I'd like to thank our panelists, Dean Lewis, Dr. Bowton Foster, Professor Noam Magina, Dr. Hamed, and OTR Zoila Rojas. And the co-TAD members would actually like to give you a quick gift. Also, because this is a panel about diversity, uh, we, have, we thought it'd be nice to say thank you so much for this learning experience in a few different languages. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam, for hosting this. This is Yoruba, which is Adupe Fum Bobonteko Kota. Um, so I'm just going to say thank you in Urdu. So I go to Ted's side, so you all have a lot of thanks to you. And then in Spanish, thank you for sharing your experiences and your sabiduría. I'd also like to thank our moderator, Dr. Thomas, as well. Great job. Bye. You deserve the clap as well as the help you received from Professor Tribble, our coordinator, Professor Patton, and the members of COTED chapter for their contributions. Thank you. Have a nice day.